There we are. Well, it's a pleasure to greet you this morning. This is our first Sunday of Advent. I have a couple of announcements that I want to make. Um, first of all, thanks for everybody uh, that was here yesterday and helped decorate the church. It looks fabulous. Um, there are Advent devotionals in the narthex for you to take home and uh, their daily devotions throughout uh, the, these four weeks leading up to Christmas. I've also put uh, probably about nine or ten book devotions, so it's a, a yearly devotional to start thinking about next year. Uh, most of the devotionals out there can be done in under five minutes. So I encourage you to pick one out and uh, think of that going into next year. Um, there's a mailbox out there if you want to uh, save yourself, what is it, 66 cents now? and you want to send cards to other church members, um, write the card, drop it in the mailbox, and our faithful mailman, mail person, Debbie, will see that it goes to the right people, but um, you can do that. Uh, this Friday is our potluck, our Friday night frenzy, or whatever you want to call that, and that is at 6.30. If you need a ride, let us know, and we'll make sure that someone is there to pick you up and take you home. It's not just a one-way trip. I'm not going to leave you here all weekend, but I have a public service announcement this morning. I, oh yeah, and it's an ugly sweater night and gift exchange. So ugly t-shirt, ugly sweater, ugly sweatshirt, whatever you've got, and a white elephant gift exchange. And I can tell you, we went shopping yesterday we picked out something really great. You guys are going to love this. But anyway, I encourage you to do that. Also, the third Sunday of Advent, which is the 17th, is going to be an ugly sweater, ugly t-shirt, sweatshirt day here. So feel free to dress somewhat inappropriately or irreverently, however you want to look at that for worship. It'll just be fun for those people who didn't get to do it. If they weren't able to go to the Friday Night Frenzy, they can still participate. Um, there won't be a white elephant gift exchange that day, but you can do the ugly shirt day. And that's it. So now my public service announcement. Coming in here this morning, fog so thick you could cut it, and just as we were getting off, five cars with no lights on. I'm sorry. I can't see, and I have good vision now. The, your headlights and taillights aren't necessarily for you to be, for you to see, but for you to be seen. So, you know, Ohio has a law. If your windshield wipers are on, you need to have on your headlights. And not just your headlights. Just don't go to the one that turns the headlights on. Make sure your taillights are on. Put it in automatic. You don't even have to think about it. But the, this picture, the one on the left, we had a lot of that this morning. And when you're at speed, 55 to 60 mile an hour, coming up on that, if that person stopped or is going slow, you don't have enough braking distance. So you need to have, and it's not just the person that's behind you's responsibility to see you it's your responsibility to make sure that you can be seen make sure your headlights and your taillights are on don't use your brights use fog lights use headlights make sure your taillights work yes Amanda because the brights um, create glare it creates a wall of light, and, and, it, and it blinds the oncoming drivers. So don't use, don't use your brights. But just please, I want us to be safe and to be safe for other people. Any other announcements? Debbie, we good? Cliff? We're good. All right, I invite you to stand, and we are going to start with our Advent devotional. Isaiah cried out, 
Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so mountains would quake at your presence. Come down to make your name known and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things, we did not expect the mountains trembled before you. In the midst of our own encounters, with uncertainty and longing for the delivered, Jesus calls to us, Away, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. Around us. We light this candle as a sign of our hope and expectation that even now God is with us, working to restore the fullness of life with him and one another. Amen. So we're going to sing a new Advent hymn. This, uh, a friend of mine wrote this song several years ago. I know we can do this, but we have four weeks to learn it because we're going to sing this at the lighting of every Advent candle. So... Lexi, are you going to sing it through the first time? Yeah. It's okay, and then we're going to twice. join her on the second verse, okay? Yep. Look, look in the manger, the baby's waiting for you. His love is more than able to reach a stable few. See his arms open wide, they're the same as when he died. So look, look in the manger, the baby's waiting for you. Look in the manger, the baby's waiting for you. His love is more than able to reach a stable few. See his arms open wide, they're the same as when he died. So look, look in the manger, the baby's waiting for you. Please join me in our call to worship from Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing our opening hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
Please be seated. When I think about the prayers that I would like lifted up today, I think of uh, the Middle East, not just Gaza, but all over the Middle East, a constant state of tension and conflict. Uh, we have the uh, war in Ukraine. Lately, there have been riots all over Europe, all over our country, and it, it's just an uh, unending conflict. And it, it just weighs heavily on me. I know it does on you as well. So I want to keep those um, lifted in prayer. Also, recently I, I saw that uh, Europe is getting inundated with snow in freezing temps. And uh, they're not used to getting that kind of weather. Um, they've got, uh, I don't know how many inches of snow falling, but the roads are very narrow and they have high walls on either side of the highway and I don't know how they get rid of all that snow but they're really getting hit right now so we want to keep them lifted in prayer but I'm anxious to hear what praises or prayer concerns are on your heart this morning Amanda Pray for equality and justice in our country and end to misogyny and racism and those things. Unfairness in courts or, or wherever uh, we find unfairness, that justice and right would prevail. Others? Debbie? Baby Ezra. Ezra. Ezra? I'm going to lift Ezra up in prayer. Dorothy? Unspoken. Unspoken. Children get yeah, no. Yeah, and I'm not familiar with the uh, white pneumonia, um, but children getting pneumonia, thanks, Kimberly. Or white lung, it was called, yeah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life that you've given us. Um, we, even in our hardship, even in our illness and in friends and relatives who are afflicted with uh, pneumonia or cancer or other issues. Um, we're not dodging bombs and, and, and such. We have a lot of unrest, granted, but we really are doing well. There are so many conflicts around the world where people are facing death every day. There is just, there's no end to the conflict that they face. Children can't go to school without worrying about whether they're going to be able to go home. Will their home be there? Parents worry about their children. Weather around the world seems to be particularly nasty right now. Uh, even worries about earthquakes and, and volcanoes. Unspoken prayers, deep concern, things that weigh heavily on our heart. Lord, you know all these things about us. You love us. Lord, we ask that you would come soon. Claim us and take us home again. But until you do, Lord, be with us. Keep us faithful. Help us to love and honor you as we should. Help us love one another. Help us extend grace, even when extra grace is required. Lord, we love you. Hear us as we pray our, our adoration to you in the rest of this service this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand for our doxology, please.
to you this morning, we offer our hearts as well. We ask that you would grow everything about us, including our generosity and all of the fruit of the Spirit that we have within us, Lord, that everything we are about would be pleasing to you and would extend your kingdom around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Please be seated. So one of the things that I, I liked about growing up was decorating for Christmas. Um, I got to do all the ornaments like the third of the way up, you know, the ones I could reach. So our tree was very heavy at the bottom with ornaments and then lighter as it went up. It's where I learned to throw clumps of tinsel onto the tree and that is from a family that lays it on a piece at a time, you know, very methodically and evenly. And mine looked like it was hit with a, uh, a leaf blower, you know, and just so difference in families. But I love decorating. My favorite, though, was putting up my grandmother's uh, nativity scene. But uh, our nativity starts, and it will grow every week. Right now, the only one in here is Mary with a couple of animals. There would have been uh, animals around her house, her place that she lived with her parents, um, until one night an angel appeared. An angel appeared. An angel appeared and talked to Mary and told her that she was the most favored, that she was one who God had chosen to mother the Savior of the world. Now, can you imagine? Mary would have been probably around 16 years old at that time. Very innocent. Think of what you might have been like at 16. Even in our orneriness, even in our most ornery state, there is still a sense of innocence that children have about them. And Mary was actually, I, I think in many respects, closer to childhood than, than being a young woman. And God chose her in her innocence. And that's one of the things that I, I really love about my neighbor, uh, their grandson, Vinny, when he comes over and, and I get to play with him. I love his innocence. So think about that going forward, what that might have been like as Mary met this angel and those words that he spoke to her. Words that filled the entire world with hope because the Savior is here for all of us, not just for a select few. Think of that message and then we get to be that angel, we get to be that innocent person that gets to carry Jesus into the world, not just for nine months as Mary carried him, but we can carry Jesus with us wherever we go. We can be that angel to someone, giving them that message of hope. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, may we have the innocence of a child as we, as we come to you. May we be that, not gullible, but just that, that free and that loving and that caring Lord, we love you so much, but you first loved us, and we're ever so grateful. We just ask that you would be with us, and fill us with that excitement, too, that excitement that a young child has as they learn something new for the first time, and they can't wait to go out and tell somebody. Lord, may we be that person to somebody else that tells them of the joy and the hope and the life and the love and the peace that they can have when Jesus Christ comes to them. Lord, may we accept you in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Things were
were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was light, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Okay, so we're going to sing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Now here's the catch. Lexi is playing, and this is a little harder piece, so she's not mic'd. She's not going to be singing, but we're not going to disappoint her. We are going to sing loud and proud for Lexi today, O Come, O Come, O Emmanuel. Please be seated. How we do, Lexi? All right. Please pray with me. Dear God, as we look upon the manger, would you help us see ourselves more clearly? Lord, reveal to us your light, your truth, and your life. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing to you. Amen. So have you ever wondered what Jesus' eyes look like or, or what his eyes saw? What did he think as he saw the cattle stall? His mom? The wise men? Or the stars in the sky from below? What was his favorite color? Was he awestruck in wonder the first time that he saw mountains, the night sky, or, or looked in his mother's eye? 
Cindy Lou looked with wonder at the Grinches. He stole their Christmas. He stole the who gifts, the decorations. And on Christmas morning, she woke to emptiness. No trees, no decorations, no gifts, no colorful wrappings or bows. And yet she still sang with all the other who's about joy. That's what Cindy Lou Who saw. No tringlers or pantukas or fuzzles or wuzzles. No Who pudding or roast beast for the Who feast. What did Jesus see? Jesus was a newborn baby. Did he see Joseph? recognize him as dad was he able to look in Mary's eyes as she held him and did he see into her soul what about you when Christmas rolls around do do your eyes sparkle with wonder in anticipation for Christmas morning or are your eyes tired jaded from the troubles of the world No twinkling lights, no sugar plums. Our eyes can be filled with the joy of the season and joyful of life as we receive Jesus afresh. You know, we have that ability this Christmas, this Advent. Maybe that's our gift to others, the joy that we have in our hearts that we can share with them. What are the sights that speak to your heart and your soul and your mind during the Christmas season? I want to invite you to take a step closer to the manger. If you need to, close your eyes. Walk. Step forward. Lean into that manger closer closer come come and behold him let's open our eyes and see Jesus in all of his creation can we see Jesus in one another every person here has the same amount of of Jesus all of him it's in one another and we can witness his awesome glory in each other scripture says lo in a manger he lay do you see him That most holy and blessed child is Jesus, the light that shines in darkness, and he invites us all to come, to come closer. And Jesus alone is light and truth and eternal life. That's our first point this morning. Second, God created all in his image. And yet his own creation did not recognize him. When we look at others, do we see Jesus? Third, have we seen and experienced God's glory? God's glory shone round about him. God's God's glory is throughout all the earth. Does our flesh desire and seek and search for Jesus? First point, Jesus is light and truth and life. It's ours to see and experience. Think about our blessing of sight for a moment. I was blessed to see my son when he was only a few seconds old. I have seen the Eiffel Tower on New Year's Eve twinkling with lights top to bottom and up and down. It was a fabulous sight. I have seen the beginning of the Nile River in person, and I've watched as two bald eagles fought over their territory, soaring above a mountaintop. 
I cannot think of anything more wonderful, though, than as I transition from this life to the next, when I will get to look on my Savior's face. I can't imagine anything I've seen to date being any better than that view. Will I be able to comprehend his true light? Will I be able to stand in his truth for eternity? Revelation chapter 21 verse 23 says this, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. That's in our next life. Here's the greatest news. In Isaiah chapter 60 is this note. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. David wrote in Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? That's present tense. That's when Dave, King David was alive. That is in the Old Testament that God is, is with us. And then in John's first letter, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, we, we read these words. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all our sins. So here's my storyboard for those verses. And indeed, I, I believe all of the Bible. Before Jesus' crucifixion, before Jesus' birth, before creation, Jesus was the light, is the light, and will always be the light, and his glory rises on us. Jesus is the light and the salvation of us all. Jesus supersedes all of creation. He is the pure light that chases away and defeats the darkness. All darkness. Any darkness. And because of that, we need never fear. And when we walk in the Christ, in, in, the, in Christ, in the light, we carry his light and we indeed are light to one another. We get to be Jesus' light to one another. We see Jesus in each other. And that's Jesus' will for all of us. One Bible scene, and I, I use it repeatedly because it really sticks out in my mind about what that means for us. And it's, it's Jesus has caught the woman into adultery. They're going to stone her, but Jesus says this. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir she said then Jesus said then neither do I condemn you and when Jesus spoke again to the people he said I am the light of the world whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life you see Jesus glory rose on that adulterous woman a sinner Jesus glory rises on all of us Sinners. Jesus chased the darkness from her life and she had nothing to fear. She need not fear stoning. She need not fear judgment or God, nor should we. We have nothing to fear. When she left her sinfulness, she had fellowship with her family. She had fellowship with the apostles. She had fellowship with us as we leave our lives of sin. 
she and we are purified in the light of Christ. That's Jesus' message to us. Here's the problem. In our earthbound estate, we don't recognize the sinfulness we carry is the same sinfulness as the adulterous woman. There's no difference. There's no difference than our sin and the sin of King David who had the affair with Bathsheba who murdered uh, Uriah, her husband. It's the same sinfulness that I have, that my neighbor has, that you have, that your neighbor has. The same sin that drug abusers have, the same sin that rapists and murderers have. You see, we're all sinners. All have fallen short of the glory of God, yet we are told, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. We learn that the Grinch's heart grew as he witnessed Christmas wasn't about gifts and wrappings and bows wasn't about feasts with who pudding and roast beast. Christmas is about seeing one another glorified in Christ Jesus. If all have fallen short of the glory of God and none are righteous, yet are saved in his blood, then the Lord God is all our light. And we are all saved by his blood. I have yet to read an exception in Scripture. Jesus Christ supersedes all creation, humanity, saints, and angels. Before Satan and evil even existed, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit were, are, and will always be. Therefore, all evil and darkness is defeated in his light. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? I assure you that none of us in Christ are condemned. That's what's necessary. To have Christ within us and to be in Christ. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. We're made perfect in Christ. Every race, color, ethnicity, every sinner, whether they've broken just a few or all of the Ten Commandments, is saved in Christ and never need fear. Jesus lay in a lowly manger of filthy and stinky cattle stall with the animals. And the invitation for us to come and behold him is ours. And we're told to get low, get on our knees, for none of us is worthy to stand. We can't stand in the presence of Jesus, and we shouldn't stand in judgment of one another. The invitation is to come and behold him. The question is, when we look at one another, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the who's of whoville, in the Grinches of life, the sinners around us, as well as the saints, do we see Jesus? The Bible doesn't say that most everyone is made in the image of God. All are made in his image. And then one of the most horrible lines, I think, in all of Scripture, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Come and behold him because he glorifies us. Have you experienced God's glory? Do we desire, do we seek, do we search for Jesus? Do we desire, seek, and search for him only as an infant? What about in the homeless? 
What about those in fenced in cells in border states? Do we know that we've pinned up Jesus? Do we seek Jesus in all others? If and when we do, I believe our hearts grow exponentially, just like the Grinches who look down on Whoville. But see, too often we look down on people, period, not from a mountaintop, but from an equal playing field. And yet we look down on people. Jesus made his dwelling among us. He left behind the glories of heaven. What king ever left such wonder and awe to live among the weakest and the worst, a people reeking of sin and evil? You see, I don't think it was necessarily the cattle stall that stunk that bad. It's the people. In our judging one another and in our evil desires, we smell And Jesus came to us all. Have you ever experienced God's glory? There's a story in the gospel that says that Jews were visiting from Greece. And they said this, we would like to see Jesus. I wonder if we really want to see Jesus because there's a catch to seeing Jesus. Jesus brings his friends. If we would see Jesus, we would have to let in all of his friends. He brings the outcasts, the tax collectors, the adulterers, the prostitutes, the cheats, the lepers, and all of the rejects of society. All those people who we would say, thank you God, I'm glad I'm not like that person. We need to remember that our worst enemies are created in God's image. They're Jesus' children too. He brings them to the table where we all sit. For us to truly experience Jesus and to be in fellowship with him, We need to be in fellowship with all. I imagine that the humanity of Jesus was just like every other infant. He had all the same bodily functions. I'm sure that he got cold and had upper respiratory things and I'm sure that he threw up at times and had all of those things about him that every infant has. But I wonder if in his godliness he looked with an exceptional, deep, and profound look upon Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men and all those who looked upon him in the manger. Did he recognize them because he created them? See, I believe that Jesus looks upon us today in this 21st century the same way. I believe that Jesus' favorite color is flesh tone, all flesh tone. I believe that his favorite creation is all of his children. His greatest experience are our experiences with him. I think his favorite view is the scene of people lined up to come and behold him. Our sinfulness, our sin, is when we fail to recognize him and receive him. And when we fail to recognize him in others and fail to receive others, that's our worst sin. When we truly see Jesus, the light of the world, when we experience him as the truth and the life, we're transformed. We are instantly made children of God, not by human descent or decision, as Cliff read the scripture this morning, but born of God. That's Christmas. That's what makes our hearts grow. Our life is not about knowing of God, but truly knowing and experiencing God. 
You see, if all Christmas is about is for gifts and packages and wrappings and bows or tringlers or, and pantukas and fuzzles and wuzzles and who pudding and roast beef, then I think we've really missed the point. That is really not what Christmas is. If we really want to experience Christmas this year, we need to use our senses to really see Jesus. Jesus alone offers us the true light, the only truth that offers hope. We lit the candle of hope this morning. Jesus is our hope, and he grants eternal life. In Jesus' light and truth, we should desire, seek, and search the eyes of others, the least, the last, and the lost, the marginalized of society, because it's in and through them that we experience God's glory. Instead of looking down on others, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the who's of whoville, and the Grinches of life, the sinners and the saints, let's choose to see Jesus in them. Then and only then can we say we would see Jesus. Come and behold him. Amen. Holy Spirit, we confess that we are sinners before you. We've left things unsaid and undone. Other times we've said too much. We've spoken out of turn. We've done the wrong thing. We've looked down on others. We've judged inappropriately. We have not loved others as ourselves. We've not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Forgive us, we pray. We ask that you would bless these elements of bread and cup that they might be for us, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, raised it to heaven, and he says this, said, this is my body that is broken for you. Eat and be thankful. Likewise, at the end of the meal, he took a cup of salvation. He raised it to heaven and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood poured out for you and for the sins of all mankind. Drink of this often and remember me and be thankful. It is Jesus who invites you to come and partake. I invite you now to come as you're led because this is his feast prepared for you. Please come. Please sing, uh, stand and sing. We're going to sing, O Come All You Faithful.
looked up some unusual Christmas traditions around the world. In Iceland, children place boots by the window, and in the morning they hope to find sweets. And they will if they've been good. If they've been bad, they find rotten potatoes. I think that would have, you can smell that long before you get there, you know. In San Fernando, Philippines, they celebrate with a giant lantern. That's in the top center, and they spin it, and it, it's just beautiful. That's thousands of lights. In Portugal and Brazil, they gather to eat around 10 p.m. I'm already in bed for a couple of hours. but And then they, they celebrate, uh, they exchange gifts at midnight, and then they have fireworks in the town square. I think that would be fun. In Ukraine, they decorate trees with spider webs, and that's in the bottom center. Spider webs are supposed to be good luck. They'd love it in our house. I, it just, no, that's not a reflection on a net. That's, that's just me. Whatever your tradition, whatever brings you close to Christ, remember that if you want to be close to Christ, it's not about boots and lights, a nativity set, spider webs or fireworks. It's about looking in the eyes of another and seeing Jesus. All others, not just the few that we select. I invite you this week to look for Jesus in unexpected places because all are created in his image. Come, let us adore him. Come. Have a blessed week.